The Now Show. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Welcome to The Now Show. I'm Steve Punts. And I'm Hugh Dennis. OK, then. Well, let's get it out of the way. Bill Clinton. <laughs> if he's guilty, then it's a whole new meaning to the term fun-loving criminal. <laughs> Last week, when it turned out he'd had Monica doing the business under the desk while he was on the phone to members of Congress. I mean, I'm sorry, it may be politically unsound, but President Lad Icon is in the building. <laughs> the trouble is that men and women are so wary in each other's company. If he could just do separate State of the Union addresses, right, and by union, I do not mean union in the sense which I understood it in January, <laughs> but if he could just do separate addresses for men and women, we'd quickly realise it's not the politicians who are the hypocrites, it's half the voters. It'd be great. He's addressed to women. Ladies of America, I know that cuddles and just talking together and being friends are important. <laughs> and we men realise that. He's addressed to men. My fellow male Americans, as I speak to you tonight, our economy is sound. Our foreign relations are stable. And I have a woman under this desk, 30 years younger than me. Now, she could suck start a Harley Davidson. Fellas, I know I can rely on your vote. I mean, why else, eh? Why else would he have got a standing ovation at the United Nations? It's just hundreds of mostly male politicians all going, well done, you got caught, I didn't. <laughs> The worst thing is that the entire female population in the world can now see how men talk about sex. And it wasn't really Clinton, it was the culprit, it was the rest of the committee. All male, and you don't see them on the video, you just keep hearing these voices asking for more and more detail. And it all sounded strangely familiar, and I couldn't think why. And then I realised it was the lower sixth form common room on a Monday morning. <laughs> The whole thing had a horribly male tone. And Mr. President, this is a very serious matter of constitutional importance. The question is, how far did you get with her? Huh? 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 Hey, hey, what base? What base? How far did you get? Huh? What base? Two, base three. Base three. <laughs> cool. Cool. Base three. Base three. <laughs> Do you give base her a feel? Have you heard of fellatio? <laughs> <laughs> he said it. The president said fellatio. <laughs> Beavis, stop looking at the pictures and ask a question. <laughs> ask about when he was on the phone. It's cool. <laughs> Monica sucks. <laughs> the Now Show. Now, Geoffrey Archer's had a good idea. Put Scotland in a different time zone. <laughs> so that London can have more daylight in winter. Londoners say to me, says Geoffrey, why should we have to go home in the dark every night? Well, it's a good question. And Geoffrey replies, because you live in a temperate northern latitude and you don't have a great deal of choice. If it bothers you so much, sell your ridiculously overpriced home and move to the equator. <laughs> no, sorry, I forgot. He's running for mayor. He doesn't say that. He says, why indeed? Apples and pears, me old Chinas. It's those bloody jocks. <laughs> Let them have their own time. Yes, it's that political astuteness that should have Geoffrey in the mayoral robes before you can say, uh, probably. Probably not. <laughs> Here are Dan and Nick. Well, I was walking down Princess Street And I thought it was late at night I heard a mad voice beside of me He said my time zone just wasn't right He said... Jeffrey, Lord Archer of Western Supermare, I went to Oxford. Oh, really? Well, nearly, and I'll be mayor of London soon. You mad right wing loon. <laughs> I said, I don't like Jeffrey. <laughs> oh, no. He's barking. <laughs> There's bats in his belfry. <laughs> And they're all mad too <laughs> If you want to be mad Then just get down and grovel Or sort of back home Write another crap novel <laughs> Don't mess with our time zones Please leave them alone Cause your lights are all on But there's no one at home <laughs> You dodgy little gnome <laughs> Bushman and Quanjip.
News broke this week that the new Euro banknote, instead of having a different national symbol for each of the 15 countries it appears in, will have one simple plain Euro symbol. Apparently, this is because it'll make it less easy to forge. Yes, it's much harder to forge a note with one anonymous bland image than 15 different notes with complicated, interesting national symbols on them. <laughs> but what this means for Britain is that the Queen will not appear on the Euro. Instead, as a compromise, she will appear on the Eurovision Song Contest. <laughs> oh, uh, just a little bit. <laughs> What's the problem here? I mean, the Queen's not on the money, so what? She's never going to find out. She doesn't carry money. Tell me, Prime Minister, am I still on the money? Mm, absolutely, Your Majesty. Mm, 100%, completely and utterly, cross my heart, mm, spit on the floor and hope to die. <laughs> Am I? No. I think down in Brussels they're fed up with the Queen lying about the way she looks. I'm not saying she's vain, but she uses stamps as mirrors. Oh, Phil, I'm looking a bit green. You'll try a first class stamp. Oh, no. Now I look like Judith Chalmers. Of course, everyone in Europe's in the same boat. And not all Euro nations have a Queen to put on the money. They have national emblems. The French have got that woman with a basket of fags or something. <laughs> the Italians have got Pavarotti strangling a cockatoo. <laughs> While the Germans have many emblems to choose from. Some last seen on the side of a tank. <laughs> While other nations root for their favourite emblem, the Germans are compelled to lobby for their second favourite emblem. We need a symbol of German pride, German leadership, and German class that is also somehow very German. Hmm, I think I have it. How about Queen Elizabeth II? <laughs> and now it's time for more high-tech, low-budget, laddish frolics in Bloke 7. Oi, Bloke! Yes? Yeah? Let him in, pass me another beer. Hooray! Greetings, bloke. All right, Avon. Who are your mates? Uh, this is Max Factor, and this is Laboratoire Garnier. <laughs> I have important news from the Federation. They're holding a wet spacesuit competition. Hooray! Come on, lads. Jeremy Clarkson's on TV. Woo! This is the redoubtable TARDIS. It's a masterpiece of retro styling. It's shaped like an old police box. And as Henry Ford said when he ran an adult video store, you can have any color as long as it's blue. <laughs> it dematerializes in six seconds. The only problem is, when it rematerializes, it's always in a disused quarry in Northumberland. <laughs> The Now Show. Well, frankly, this week it's been a bit difficult finding anything other than Clinton stories in the papers, but we have found some from OK. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah. They're quite good, actually. They've got this section, Seven Days World News from OK magazine. For them, the major stories this week are uh, Scary Spice's wedding to dancer Jimmy Golzar. <laughs> Obviously, Interesting yes. stuff. She's had a ring made for him with two linked circles engraved. That apparently is their symbol. Two people, she says that are each individuals, but they join in the middle. Hmm. That's not a love token. Not really. That's a Venn diagram. Yes. <laughs> Jimmy is not a subset of Mel, nor is Mel a subset of Jimmy, but Mel and Jimmy is a subset of Jimmy, and Jimmy and Mel is also a subset of Mel. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever, it's, it's very, very romantic, romantic isn't yeah. it? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, now uh, we're very privileged. Would you please welcome the man whose heart pumps pure truth around his body politic, Alan Parker, Urban Warrior. <laughs> Cheers. What have we got? Nothing. <laughs> when do we want it? Now! <laughs> Ask yourselves a question. The Birmingham Six are free. When will the rest of Birmingham be free? <laughs> The Bill Clinton issue by Bill Clinton, President of the United States of whatever. Right? He's under a lot of pressure to resign. The question is, should he stick it out or should he not have stuck it out in the first place? <laughs> I have considered that question very carefully. My considered conclusion 
is this. I don't care. <laughs> I don't care. Doesn't matter. It's what's happening out in the streets, you know. Look at the state of this country, man, you know. Beggars on the streets. And what are they doing, those beggars? Begging? They're begging, that's right, my friends. <laughs> Lots of knowledge back, yeah. <laughs> And there's so much stigma attached to that begging. But, you know, if we act together, we can break down that stigma. Just because you're rich, it doesn't mean you shouldn't beg. It's <laughs> <laughs> got <them's> radical solutions. <laughs> but on the, on the jobs thing, right, if you've got a job, the message is a simple one. Do it well. And when Friday comes, take your pay packet with pride. Then give it back. Let them know you don't need their money. <laughs> Yeah. And what sort of job is it? Hello, customer services, how can I seem to help you? <laughs> Violence on the streets, right? So walking down the road the other day, I saw two blokes beating up another bloke. Right? Unfair violence. Situation like that, you've got to get involved. And I started running towards the scene of the unfair violence when I remembered that I am a coward, technically. <laughs> so what was I going to do? Unfair violence, didn't want to get hurt. I'll tell you what I did, my friends. I shouted, right? Say, so the unfair violence is going on, right? I was running towards it, I stopped. This is what I shouted. For the sake of the Lord, God Almighty and Jesus Christ! It's bollocks, but it works. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's scared of nutters. <laughs> <laughs> Even nutters are scared of religious nutters. <laughs> Cheers, see you later. Gun and Nick. <laughs> On the 15th November, in the Oval Office study, Ms. Lewinsky performed on the President in the Hallway. <laughs> on the 17th November, in the Oval Office study, the President fondled Ms. Lewinsky's bear, <laughs> and she performed on the President in the Bathroom. <laughs> on the 31st December, in the Oval Office study, the president unzipped his and exposed his Weow! He fondled and kissed her And she performed <laughs> On the president in the bathroom all the hallway On the 31st of March In the Oval Office study The president had a cigar He unzipped his And exposed his And he fondled and kissed her Ding, dong, hula, hula, moosley, moosley, rumba, rumba, rah, cowboy. <laughs> but she did not perform on the president on this particular occasion. <laughs> Bushman and Quan Jim. These are the most popular topics on the internet. Did you see EastEnders last night? <laughs> Conkers that look like cabinet ministers. <laughs> www.upskirt. This is true. The bit about the Conkers wasn't, but there is an internet site devoted to stills taken from TV programmes where you can see up the presenter's skirt. Upskirt. <laughs> Every day, someone thinks of a new thing we'll be able to do by internet. Dating by internet, shopping by internet, voting by internet. They say the internet will have us all shopping by computer. There is a contrary argument. No, it won't. <laughs> Mum is not going to shop by computer because Mum likes to know that the outcome of shopping is groceries, not £50 million debited from her current account and an avocado with a derived data post two weeks later. <laughs> what I don't get is that apparently... Everyone in the world is going to be working from home. Everyone in the world. No one will ever step outside the house again. Everyone's going to be working from home. Everyone's going to be living from home and ordering things from home. And that includes the delivery men. <laughs> I want to know, how can a delivery man work from home? You see, the internet is supposed to be a very useful source of facts. But say you want to write something about ants. You type in the word ant... Press search, and this is what happens. Antigua. Ant and Deck. Anti-Nazi League. Anti-Ant and Deck League. <laughs> Ant travels with my. Anthea Turner. You can see right up her skirt. Everyone talks about the internet like some brilliant giant library. 
No one seems to mention that unlike a naff old book-based library, the internet isn't free because you log on through your phone line. Logging on to do some research on the internet is the same as ringing up Arthur Scargill, asking him what he thinks of Peter Mandelson, and leaving the phone on your desk. <laughs> Come back two hours later, Arthur will just be getting going, and the chairman of BT will have bought France as a holiday home. <laughs> you see, they said also the internet was going to end war. Well, we've had it for quite a while now, and it hasn't stopped war in Chechnya, war in Bosnia, war in Sudan, war in Palestine. It didn't even stop the so-called high-tech Gulf War. And with this new internet computer, Mr. Hussein, you can negotiate with America by internet and prevent a war. Ugh, stuff that. Fire the Scud missiles. I'm going to look at stills of Carol Smiley where you can almost see her knickers. <laughs> the Now Show. And now, more crass revelations from the moral guardian of the mammal world. It's the Furry Springer Show! Welcome, welcome. On today's show, minks. Should we let them go? Or should we do anything we can to warm our hands on a mink muff? <laughs> With us is Dolores. Dolores, you're what, uh, a chicken? Yeah, that's right, Jerry. And what happened to you? Well, for the, these minks, all they care about is chicks. They were all over my daughter, and they, and they took her away. Are you saying these mink stole? Yes. <laughs> and where was your son? He was out getting laid. <laughs> Steve, you're a mink. Why did you bother Dolores' daughter? Well, you see, Jerry, uh, I, I love her, I guess. And also, I was quite hungry. <laughs> all right, all right. Carl is a beaver. Carl, what do you think about the plight of the minks? I couldn't give a damn. <laughs> no, man, that's typical. No one cares about us minks. We're always getting hunted and shot at. There he goes. Get him. <laughs> Yo, man, you missed. You hit the beaver. You know, it's always distressing to see a beaver shot. <laughs> <laughs> but we all have to move on. Join us next time when we talk to a squirrel who complains that a bird ate his nuts. <laughs> Now, I don't want to worry anyone, but imminent world economic collapse is upon us. The FTSE has dropped below 5,000, the Nikkei is going kamikaze, and Gordon Brown is hoarding tins and planting the garden of number 10 with potatoes. It's going to be like the 1930s, soup kitchens, doll cues, films with RKO radio pictures at the beginning. What will I do? Will I put everything on Barclay Card in the hope they'll go bust before I have to pay? Or use, or use what little money I have to buy a wheelbarrow to transport the vast bundle of 50-pound notes I'll need to buy a pint of milk and a Twix? <laughs> You see, the main problem with financial crises is that so few people understand them. I heard on the radio this week that the man Yeltsin wants to appoint as his new finance minister thinks the best way out of the crisis would be to print lots more rubles. <laughs> this is on a par with having a defence minister who thinks that if everyone was nice to each other, there would be no war. <laughs> Well, what annoys me is that banks make a big fuss about lending you the money to build a kitchen extension, and yet they'll happily lend billions to Boris Yeltsin to stop him defaulting on his odd bins account. <laughs> now, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to work out that turning the Soviet Union into a capitalist paradise wasn't going to be that simple. Under communism, the business news was nice and easy. <laughs> Good evening. Here is Stock Exchange News. Stock Exchange is evil capitalist institution to take money from workers and distribute it to shareholders for doing nothing. We have no Stock Exchange. <laughs> that is the end of Stock Exchange News. <laughs> and now the weather. Cold. Good night. Basically, large portions of the banking and business world in Russia are run by the Mafia. And businesses run by the Mafia have always operated slightly differently. <laughs> Good evening, this is Financial Roundup. I'm Johnny the Horse Maldini. <laughs> Morelli's Pizza Emporium announces happier profits down by 50%. Mr. Morelli has taken early retirement. <laughs> Jackson's Import-Export Company, the bellwether blue-chip laundering operation for narcotics, has announced full-year profits of $185 million before tax. After tax, that's also $185 million. <laughs> Two IRS men are currently in the main sewer. The Dow Jones finished the day down 76. Fishknife Jones finished the day down the morgue. 
Best wishes to all viewers, also to your wives and your families. This has been Financial Roundup Business News for those with respect. Ciao. <laughs> What really annoys people about the financial world is that these people pay themselves fortunes for just guessing things and getting them massively wrong half the time. As we head into meltdown and economic catastrophe, people want advice from someone they can truly trust. Now that is a big opening for the church. In future, consult your independent financial vicar. Um, I'm thinking of buying property. The foolish man built his house upon the sand, but the wise man built his house upon the rock. Ah, I see. But the even wiser man built his house upon the sand, but took out full buildings insurance, including comprehensive subsidence coverage. <laughs> then took the money and built several houses upon the rock, one for himself and others to rent out. Ah, well, thank you. Yes, the I... foolish man built his house upon the sand, and the wise man built his house upon the rock. But by this time, there were many houses upon the rock, that space was at a premium, and prices on the rock shot up, and the wise man sold out at the peak. But the foolish man bought in just at the top of the cycle as rock property crashed and sand prices rose. <laughs> Meanwhile, the wise man had bought a house upon the sand only to see its value rise steadily as a result of the massive overvaluation of the rock sector. <laughs> the wise man had reinvested his profits in safe investments, but the foolish man had bought a Porsche and a string of Russian sock shops. <laughs> wise man floated his sand holdings as a public company, bought a house upon the rock and settled down to a comfortable retirement. But the foolish man began to drink heavily, fell off the rock and concussed himself. <laughs> then burnt down the house on the sand in a pathetic attempt to defraud his insurers and ended up in prison. Fortunately, the prison had been built on the sand and he tunnelled out and escaped. <laughs> Unfortunately, he tunnelled into the side of the rock, had to turn round and go back and wound up back in prison where he was caught, put in solitary and given a concrete floor. <laughs> The moral is, when building a house, always use a surveyor. <laughs> and remember, the destination of your soul can go down as well as up. <laughs> That'll be £85, please. Alan Parker, Urban Warrior. Perfect planning prevents pathetic performance. <laughs> Perfect planning prevents pathetic performance. And chucking stuff at your employees makes you a Nazi in my book. <laughs> You've seen that? It's the government campaign to make everyone panic about the euro. I don't know why everyone should panic about that. It's just another form of money you won't have. <laughs> a different shaped gap in your pocket, that's all. <laughs> yeah, and, all right, and the tabloids getting in a fuss because it won't have the Queen's head on it. Just makes you feel less guilty when you burn it. <laughs> view on that issue. Anyway, what sort of slogan is that? Perfect planning prevents... No. Right, you want a classic slogan like Maggie, 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 ow, ow, ow. It's got a ring to it, you know. I chanted that for ten years and then she resigned. You don't have to thank me, you know. <laughs> I've been trying to work on the Blair issue. Blair's been going on about the third way and I'm thinking, third way, third right, thin line. <laughs> But basically, I was trying to do an adaption, like, Blair, Blair, Blair. But by the time you said that, it's like you've been sick three times. <laughs> Nowhere to go. <laughs> and the, the president of the Euro du thing, bank, whatever you call it, he's Dutch. Right? Anyone here been to Amsterdam? Yeah. Right, right, did you like it? Yeah. I went there just for a weekend, and I didn't get on that well. And maybe it's an odour thing, you know, because the Dutch are all clean and that, but... <laughs> to my mind, soap and water is just another tool of government oppression grinding you down. <laughs> Press hard with the soap. But, um, the point is, right, I say very simply, Dutch... Deutsch. <laughs> Basically, the Dutch are the Germans, but without the shame. <laughs> I'm not saying there's anything wrong with the, the Germans at all. I say Europe, not America. That's what I say, yeah. And people get annoyed because of the repetition, but it's <laughs> one way of getting the message across, you know. But there's nothing wrong with the Germans, you know. There's, there's, there's so much nothing wrong with them, that's why people don't like them, because they're too much, particularly in the football area, they're, they're, they're too much nothing wrong with them there. <laughs> Starting the war as well, I suppose. But, but basically, we, we've got a lot to be grateful to the Germans for. Um, <laughs> if it weren't for them, we'd be the most hated people in Europe. <laughs> I'm just talking to the English people, not the Irish, Scots, Welsh. No one hates you. 
no one knows who the hell you are, but <laughs> you should do, and I'd lead you out of the cold if you let me. <laughs> also, on the Dutch Deutsch equation, right, did you know this? Holland is built on land reclaimed from the sea. Did you know that? Oh, that is what the Dutch say. Oh, yeah, they go, yeah, reclaimed from the sea, like, like it was Holland once, and then the sea took it. Oh, yeah, they're just getting it back. Oh, yeah. And Hitler was just reclaiming Poland. And if the Dutch keep on reclaiming land from the North Sea further and further out, where's that going to end? Great Yarmouth, by my reckoning. So if you're out that way, keep your telescopes on the horizon. Look out for a fast-moving pier, my friends. We could all end up wearing clogs. And anyway, what is the national symbol of Holland? It's the windmill. What are windmills really but swastikas put to a practical use? <laughs> oh, <that's thinking. laughs> well, that's about it for this week. But uh, we realise a lot of you will want to read further on the presidential crisis in the States. And we've uh, come across a list in this week's Economist of the various books which have been rushed into print on this uh, subject. Now, we don't have full synopses. They do hopefully reflect the broad range of public opinion. They are uh, High Crimes and Misdemeanors, The Case Against Bill Clinton by Ann Coulter, Regnery Press, $24.95. The Death of Outrage and the Assault on American Ideals by William Bennett, Free Press, $20. And Lucky Bastard <laughs> by Charles McCarry, and that's published by Random House. So, at the end of a week, which was really dominated by any one story, you probably feel you really want to get away uh, from Clinton and Monica. And uh, what I would suggest on Saturdays for the perfect antidote is to settle down and watch ITV's new prestigious flagship costume drama. Just lose yourself in that. It's an adaptation of C.S. Forrester's most enduring character, uh, Hornblower. <laughs> Thank you. The Now Show was brought to you by Jane Bussman, Dan Friedman, Simon Munnery, David Quantic, and Nick Romero, and was hosted by Steve Punt and Hugh Dennis. It was developed by Bill Dare with the producer, Aled Evans. <laughs>